my goodness, I can't think of a better way to start the morning than that, but I'm going to try. Um, good morning. My name is Megan. My pronouns are she and they, and I am so excited to be leading music for worship this morning with our wonderful music director, Pablo Wiley Bustos. Um, if you would rise in voice, body, and spirit, or spirit, as we start with our opening hymns, uh, come now, fount of every blessing, and then we're going to roll right into We Give Thanks. Good morning. I am Reverend AJ. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm delighted to welcome you this morning to First Unitarian Church of Rochester, where our mission here is that through spiritual connection in community, we listen deeply to others and ourselves. We open to wonder and transformation, and we serve together with love and humility. We acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, keepers of the Western Door, and part of the Haudenosaunee people on whose ancestral and contemporary lands First Unitarian now stands. If you are new or new-ish with us, we invite you uh, to connect with us at the welcome table so we can help you get connected. If you're here because you're going through a hard time or you're worried about somebody else who is, please connect with one of our pastoral care chaplains. We have them here and in person and online. You can connect with them during the service by stepping out into the lobby, or you can connect afterwards. Do stick around after uh, worship this morning because we have connection following it, various different uh, smaller group uh, and various sized group opportunities to build that spiritual connection in community with one another. I have one verbal uh, update that didn't make it into the announcements uh, on the newsletter email. 
Um, but the Unitarian Buddhist Fellowship that we have here is offering a connection in the Thoreau room upstairs. So be sure to look at that. And after the service, the various offerings will be on the slides uh, out in the lobby and here in the sanctuary. And it's, well, we've had Thanksgiving. Now we've got more holidays coming up. And so, of course, here at First Unitarian, that means we are anticipating our greater good service and project. This is a, a program that was started by the youth and the, the kids of our congregation many years ago, and we continue it to this day. Uh, there's a big service on December 11th, greater good service. We are all invited to come, and we do a big uh, collection uh, of money to give to two organizations that are doing good works and making the world a better place. And since we do this every year, uh, we thought we would have, it would be good to have a little update, a recap from the recipients of the program last year. So we have a video to share from our team. Hi, my name is Jenny Gall, and I was the Greater Good Committee chairperson last year for uh, 2022. And I will give you an update of how that funding was spent and what it made possible over this year. First of all, we had Driving for Change, which was a program of keeping our promise here in Rochester. To date, the program has paid for a series of driving lessons and the initial five-hour driving instruction course for 31 Afghan uh, refugees and immigrants, 15 of whom have been women. And Driving for Chain has also worked with the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles to get their road manual translated into Dari for native speakers. Also, we uh, supported the Edge of the Woods uh, program, which was a summer experience hosted by Ganondagan. The overnight camp experience ended with a visit uh, from First Unitarian Youth to experience the welcome ceremony firsthand. Or not hear words that, you know, are disrespectful. I think that our traditions are, like, starting to, like, not be as strong as they used to be. So I think it's important to pass it on to the next few generations. And I hope that um, you guys can come back as campers, but also come back and to be sitting in a place like where Jocelyn is and the, the place where Walter is and the forward one, and you're gonna wrap backwards, twist it, change places. You would know how to cut it, prepare it, and cook it, and serve it to other people as well as yourself. So. I enjoyed it because the food was really good. We made popcorn and we were just around the fire, hanging out, and then they just tell us like a whole bunch of other stories that I, I never knew about. It's always just a good thing to know about your um, religion, and our religion can still be alive and keep on going. I appreciated the camp because nowadays there's not many first language speakers or people who even know what Edge of the Woods like ceremony was and how they, how would it work. So the camp really taught me a lot about that and also taught me a lot about my culture as well. A lot of the things that stuck out is just to always remember like where our people came from, how our people operated back then, and just how we treat each other, how we'd be welcoming for people to come and like enter our village if they needed food or shelter. Being around other native kids too is telling me like what happens, they're like what's normal for them and on their reservations or where they live and how it's so different from how I was raised and how it is on my reservation. It felt nice to connect with indigenous kids my age because Back in Buffalo, you can't do that very often. I have no, almost no one who is my ethnicity except my family in Buffalo. So it was actually really cool to see other kids like me. And leaders say they have enough money to seed the program again for the upcoming summer. So thanks again for your generous support of the Greater Good Project. I'll see you on December 11th. Get those red envelopes ready and let's do it big. And now as we begin this sacred time together and creating sacred space, I invite you to take a deep breath in and out. 
And wherever you are, light a chalice at home, perhaps, as we light our chalice here together with these unison words. Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and mysteries of this great gift. were Christmas cactus, poinsettias, and amaryllis or other bulbs. Um, the poinsettia one really caught my eye because I have one that I love but it's been looking kind of sad and lackluster. So I thought it needed a little TLC and in this article there were very simple directions. The plant needed to go in darkness at 5 p.m. And I put it in a closet, I've been putting it in a closet, and at 8 a.m. it comes out. <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> Did you get my text this morning? Thank you. <laughs> That's the key. Um, I was supposed to start that in October and go through until blossoms start to appear. And at that point, bring it out. I'll be setting it on its original table and we'll see what happens. See, when I bought that plant, I just loved the colors, red and green and some speckling of white. Kind of reminded me of a Jackson Pollock painting. And isn't that why we come to church? Here at First Unitarian, as we enter the season of darkness, we are encouraged to take time to sit and be still, sometimes in the dark, to help recalibrate and prepare for our inner, inner urgings that want to bloom and grow. Welcome to our service today. Before we carry on with the program, please rise and greet your neighbors. is an adaptation by a piece by Reverend Edward Searle. The adaptation is done by Christina Church. Both ministers are from the UU faith, 
and Edward Searle is no longer living. Always there is a beginning, a new day, a new month, a new season, a new year. Forever the old passes away and newness emerges from the richness that was. Nothing is ever lost in the many changes time brings. What was in some way will be. Though changed in form, always there is a beginning. A new day, a new month, a new season, a new year. And as we begin this new thematic season into the season of darkness, as we enter into this dark edge of the year, I invite you now into a meditation for rooting underground to the foundations beneath you. So <clears throat> first of all, feel free to adapt any part of this practice to what your body needs in this moment or in general. But if it works for you, I invite you to uncross your legs and plant the, your feet firmly on the ground. Assume a posture that lets you breathe fully and easily. If comfortable, close your eyes and imagine roots spreading down from your feet down into the earth. Maybe the roots are going down from your seat or wherever your body touches that which supports it. Wherever you feel gravity holding you up and also holding you close. Let the roots run deep in the dark underground as you breathe in and out. Let the roots beneath you pull nutrients from the dark, damp soil, from that source that is both beyond and within yourself. Perhaps you know it as Mother Earth, perhaps as the great soul, perhaps humanity. Perhaps stillness. Whatever that source is, however named, whatever it is that sustains and revives your spirit, pull that support and nutrients from it. And at the same time, let your breath draw inspiration from the crisp air above you and let your exhale give thanks and gratitude to the whole world of being for supporting and making possible your being. Let the roots within you connect to the deepest foundations of yourself, connecting and aligning you to that which is growing and burgeoning within you perhaps still to grow in the safe shelter of darkness within for a time, but destined to bloom soon enough like a holiday plant. Let the great earth holding you firm, hold all that you need it to, hold all that you are holding including your grief and laments, all that your heart aches for in this bruised but beautiful world. Here in this rootedness with breath and source and stillness, let us hold silence for a few moments more together.
Amen. And blessed be. We now enter into ritual time in our service to bring what is on our hearts and lay it on the altar of community and spirit. Honoring the complexities of life, bring to mind whatever grief, gratitude, or growth is alive within you. Online, you're invited to share it in the chat and here in the sanctuary, you are invited forward to one of the altars to light a candle. If you would like an usher to bring a candle to you to help light it, please raise your hand. May we now share in this ritual of community care and witness to one another's hearts.
Everything our church does for ourselves and others is made possible by what we bring to it. Each week, we practice shared generosity to support the work and witness of Unitarian Universalism in Rochester, and half of our Sunday offering goes to a partner organization working to create a more just and loving world. Today, we share our plate collection with Isaiah House. This is a special home located here in Rochester on Prince Street. It's a home that provides comfort care for the dying. Reverend Libby Moore, a former member of this church and long-term volunteer with Isaiah House before she moved, puts it this way. It's a place full of grace and love staffed mainly by volunteers who are angels in disguise. Where life happens, where families are cared for, where people who are dying are able to live their best lives until the very end. It welcomes people who have nowhere else to go, and that gives everyone who walks through the door the sense that they are worthy of love and compassion. The offering will now be gratefully received. Well, here we are, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. The harvest done, the night's growing longer, and our new thematic season, the season of darkness, is here, and with it, our theme of underground. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to dig deep, go underground, and try to explore the foundations of faith. What is it that our tradition, Unitarian Universalism, ultimately relies upon and springs forth from? And as individuals, our individual faith, what are our deepest values and commitments, those that shape all our other beliefs, views, and actions, and attitudes? And I suppose if we're going to be serious about this, if I'm going to be serious about this theme of foundations, then we should start at the foundation, at the beginning, and ask, well, what 
a foundation. I think I'm having some audio trouble, so I'm going to... Mike, we're good? All right. So what is a foundation? So to define the foundation of a building, I, of course, turn to the Internet Dictionary. A foundation is the lowest load-bearing part of a building, typically below the ground level. To define the foundation of a personal theology, I turn to the Reverend Doctors Rebecca Parker and John Burens in their book, A House for Hope, which explores progressive theology using the metaphor of different aspects of a house to create the different sections of their book, such as the roof or the walls, or of course, the foundations. And so when introducing the section on foundations, they pose this question to frame things. Who or what do we most deeply trust? What do we rely on as the foundational given in relationship to which our lives find their meaning, purpose, and hope? To define the foundation of a whole religious tradition, we can certainly turn to history, but I think if we do that, we can bias things towards what is the more traditional, the conservative, the old answers. So maybe a different way to define a tradition of looking at the foundations of a tradition, at least in the case of Unitarian Universalism, would be to look at the larger denominational bylaws, and in particular, Article 2, the principles and purposes of the denomination. Now, a couple of you in the audience are laughing because you are very involved in our denominational or national organizational processes and know exactly where I'm going with this. But uh, for those of you who don't, it may be news to hear that Article 2 of our national organization's bylaw are currently being revised. And if this is your first Sunday at a Unitarian Universalist church, don't worry, I promise not to go too far down the rabbit hole of bylaws and governance practices and all that. But I do want to give some context that this Article 2 of our bylaws, this is where you will find the principles of Unitarian Universalism articulated, along with a statement of religious pluralism and the various sources that we draw upon and there are other sections in the article as well, like a statement on inclusion and freedom of belief. And I also want to share that as we are going through this process of revising this perhaps foundational articulation of Unitarian Universalism, I want to share what the Board of Trustees of the UU Associ Unitarian Universalist Association said to the team charged with proposing changes. They said, there is nothing sacred about the number of principles or sources, nor their specific wording, nor in the way that Article 2 is laid out. We encourage creativity. The board would like to see an Article 2 that is inspirational, that is inspirational, memorable, and poetic. Now, there is a draft that is currently out put forth by this team for comment. And if you're interested in the specifics, we will. Uh, I will be leaving a connection after the service to dig deep. Uh, we'll be in the Susan B. Anthony Lounge, or you can join my Zoom room. The link will be in the chat. But for now, we just want to think about the fact that revisioning is being considered, because it brings up for me this theological question. Is the language in Article 2, the principles of Unitarian Universalism and the sources, is that the foundation of Unitarian Universalism? Is a series of statements about value, sources, and freedom of belief really the foundation of a faith tradition? And again, I ask myself, asking what is a foundation? What makes a foundation a foundation? Is it its permanence, that it never changes? Some religious perspectives would say that, yes, their truth and value of a foundation of their faith comes from its unchanging permanence. But if this is true, what to make of the revision process? Or is what makes a foundation a foundation its function? A foundation's simple ability to support the weight and complexity of everything that is above it, that makes it what it is. To return to the literal example for a moment, the foundations of a building do sometimes get old and get cracks appear, and the whole thing needs to be and can be replaced. But then again, if I think about this hard enough, both the old and the new foundations 
rest upon the same foundation themselves, the earth, the crust of the earth. And that rests on top of the mantle, if I'm remembering my geology lessons from elementary school, right? And that rests on the core, and the core of our planet rests on, I don't know, something to do with physics and gravity and internal inertia and mass. The point is that we can eventually find ourselves talking, taking that direction on and on almost to infinity to grander and grander explanations that ultimately leave us in mystery. What is the foundation of our material existence? This line of thinking is, it reminds me often, it reminds me of the child who asks their parent, why? And then to every single answer given, the nuanced follow-up question, why? Until the parent keeps ask, answering and answering and the question returns, why? Until the parent's knowledge and patience is exasperated and the answer is, it just is. Which on the one hand might be just the end of one person's knowledge or where you can go, but it just is might also be a profoundly deep theological statement about mystery. Children's are among the best philosophers, as it turns out, or at least rank among their company. Many of the foundational philosophers of Western society, including Aristotle and Descartes, were quite aware that in their pursuit of simple, clear knowledge about life, the universe, and everything, they did eventually have to just begin at what they called first principles. These ideas that you can't derive from anything else, the concepts where you begin a philosophical construct from, the premises from which you prove all other arguments, but which can't really be proved themselves. You can't ask why about them, they just are. Now that doesn't mean that first principles in philosophy are arbitrary, of course. Take Descartes' famous, I think, therefore I am, statement. The first principle here really is just the part that says, I think, which is his evidence to support the statement, I am. And he has good reason to believe that he thinks. Not too many people return, retort to Descartes that say, no, you are actually not thinking. It's not the kind of thing that can really be proven or disproven though. It's foundational to Descartes' philosophy. It's where he starts and what everything else rests on. But the thing about first principles is they aren't actually where anyone starts. Descartes lived a whole life and thought many deep thoughts before writing his meditations down. We are always already living and being in and of the world. Unitarian Universalism already always exists before the articulations in a certain article of the bylaws. And so the more I think about this, the more I am persuaded that first principles, valuable though they are, can only ever be depths to be plumbed, not an actual starting point. They are an exercise in trying to articulate things back to their simplest essence, but ultimately share the fate of the child philosopher's question, why? What foundation does that rest on? Eventually, you can't go back any further and words fail. Words failing is one of the reasons I'm so grateful to a foundational transcendentalist and Unitarian minister in our history from the 19th century, Theodore Parker. His words we sang earlier as the musical meditation, be ours a religion. But his most famous and influential sermon was called the transient and the permanent in Christianity. And his basic argument as he got to the foundations of what he thought his religion was about, his basic argument was that what was permanent about religion, what was essential and unchanging, were the fundamental moral truths. And for him, these were expressed in the teachings of Jesus. But these fundamental moral truths were, of course, expressed in a particular time and place by the historical figure of Jesus. So what was transient, what changes from age to age, was everything besides the moral truths, including the language used to express those truths and those teachings. So one, one version of this is just remembering that, oh right, we might talk about religious truth in the English language, 
But that's not the language that Jesus spoke or that Buddha spoke. So no matter what we are exploring, it is often always in translation. But even within the same language or language families, the way that we interpret and articulate religious truth changes from age to age, century to century. This was Parker's point. He says that if, even if Jesus had never existed, the moral religion that he preached would still be true. That would still be permanent. But each age understands it differently and uses different language. So I am constantly returning to this concept of the transient and the permanent, particularly when it comes to religious articulation and languages, and particularly in this time of revising the Article 2 of the Unitarian Universalist Association bylaws. I remind myself that the exact words that we use to describe Unitarian Universalism today aren't the same thing as Unitarian Universalism itself. Because there's always the word that we use to describe an idea like love or truth or God or even Unitarian Universalism. And then there's the thing itself. The word love captures a great many things, but it doesn't capture everything or the fullness of compassion, of love. There's the thing itself that lives beyond our feeble attempts to tame it in the cage of human language. And so I do think that the basic ideas of Unitarian Universalism are perhaps permanent and unchanging, but how they are expressed in each century and each decade is always in flux. So considering all of this, is something like the articulation of the principles found in the current Article 2 the foundation of Unitarian Universalism? I would say no. Because the words that we use to talk about faith, personal or institutional, are only ever pointers to the truth, not the truth itself. And yet, does that mean we should just say nothing, not have any article that says, here are the principles and the purposes and the reasons that we gather together in churches and communities and a larger association? No. I think we do have to attempt the articulations. At least we do if we want our tradition to have any collective meaning, to have any institutional form, and to last into the future in any meaningful way. And we also have to take time to articulate our personal faith as well. Because while certainly some spiritual practices may help us strive towards a blissful state of non-thought beyond language and categorization, and if that appeals to you, perhaps the Unitarian Buddhist Fellowship offering during Connection will be the place for you. There is value in that. And yet, we do come out of those meditations. We do exist as creatures that use language all the time as part of our decision making, as part of our identity formation, as how we understand the world and our place in it. And so the question comes to each individual, just as it comes to our larger denomination. What is foundational? To your faith? How would you describe, in the simplest terms, the most basic truths that you live your life by, even knowing that words will ultimately fail to capture it? For me, it would be something like, we are all connected. And no one person or language or religion has the final say on how we can talk about that supreme interconnection. That, for me, is foundational because from there, from the idea of interconnection, I can derive all of my ethics of equality, of equity, of mutuality and balance and justice. And from no one having the final say on how to articulate truth, I can derive my love of diversity, of growth and change. But again, these aren't actually where I begin. These are distillations, depths I have dived into, foundations I have dug to construct and find out of a life lived within Unitarian Universalism. So that's an attempt at my answer. What might be yours? What is foundational to you about Unitarian Universalism? if that is the faith you claim. And if not, or regardless of that 
claiming of identity, what is at the root of your values, your beliefs? What is at the root of who you want to be and how you want to be in the world? What will you lift up, teach to others, and strive to cultivate in the world? As you reflect, always remember that whatever words you might come up with, whatever phrases and language, helpful as they may be, they aren't the thing themselves. They can be helpful, but they can only ever point to the values, the beliefs, the ideas that they are inspired by and ultimately exist in service of. Whatever articulations we have of our foundations aren't really the foundations. And so the principles and sources of Unitarian Universalism were never really the foundation of Unitarian Universalism either. And the new Article II won't be. As Susie reminded us with the words from Reverend Edward Searle, never forget the old passes away and newness emerges from the richness of what was. Nothing is ever lost in the many changes time brings. What was in some way will be, though changed in form. Perhaps this rings true to your own spiritual journey. Perhaps your articulations and your ideas have changed, maybe just a little bit, but maybe drastically from the faith you were raised in, or from other important philosophies and traditions and ways of thinking. And yet, I would wager that there has been an essential core, something that is still connected, something that propelled you to move from the older tradition, the older ways of thinking, to the new. And so even as things may be constantly changing, you may be updating and changing how you talk about your own faith and beliefs, that does not make it a capricious endeavor or arbitrary. It is in fact always a deepening, a going, deeper. And the things that once were foundational, but perhaps have found out to not be foundational in the end, still exist in some way, though perhaps changed in form. Nothing is ever lost. And so I also want to say that, for instance, in the Article 2 conversation, the language of the current principles will still exist and will still be usable. I am quite sure that I will still use the words, the inherent worth and dignity of every person when I am talking about and describing Unitarian Universalism, even if the new Article 2 doesn't include that exact phrase. The language we used, we heard from Theodore Parker in Be Ours a Religion, still it's 150, 200 years old language. And there's many things that we today would disagree with Theodore Parker about in his theology, and yet that articulation is still foundational and still speaks to us, and it doesn't have to be, it's not in our bylaws or in our written down articulation, but it is in our hymnal. And so the principles, I think, will continue to be an important foundation that our unfolding living tradition is being built upon, as it is always being built just as whatever articulations arise in this process will in a few decades time be the slightly outdated but still relevant foundations for the next articulation of Unitarian Universalism. And so in that spirit, let us close with a traditional Unitarian Universalist hymn, perhaps the oldest and earliest hymn to claim such a title, because this hymn as tranquil streams was written in 1933 to commemorate the joint hymnal that the Unitarians and the Universalists compiled together, a shared project nearly 30 decades before the merger of the two denominations. And so it is fully a Unitarian Universalist hymn. So let us now sing this nearly century old hymn that asks us to trust the dawning future more.
our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. May we hold our foundations close, having clarity within ourselves and among our churches of who we are and what we are about to proclaim the truth that makes us free, all the while remembering that the words we use for that truth are just words and not the sacred truths themselves. Go in peace. <laughs>join a breakout room or you can also go to Reverend um, AJ's discussion on article two. I'll put that link in the chat in just a moment. If you need any help getting to where you want to go, give me a shout.